Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our tonight's um, Java user group talk. My name is Patrick, and I will be the moderator for today. So with me, Bert-Jan Schriever from Open Value, and I actually urged him or asked him to do something new for us. So it will be a talk which was not or is not on YouTube yet, and we will put it on YouTube anyway, as you know. So it will be today about debugging distributed systems, some war stories. I hope there will be also some fun in between, some laughter and so on. But first, a few notes. If you have questions, please add them, not to the chat, but add them to the Q&A part of Big Marker. That helps me actually to like filter out the questions. And if they are fitting nicely to the talk, I might interrupt and Bert Jan during the talk with these questions so he, he can answer those. Other questions I will take at the end as well, of course. At the end, you will also get redirected to Wonder Me so we can have a short chat and you can ask him directly questions or we just like finish um, the talk and like, yeah, end it with some networking. But now let's head over to Bert Jan. So I would say Bert Jan, you are going to introduce yourself anyway, and um, I would say the stage is yours. Thank you, Patrick. So thanks everyone uh, for joining uh, this evening. I'm looking forward to presenting a brand new talk. So I was discussing with Patrick who was speaking at uh, the jerk, and I said, I can do this talk or this talk. And he says, no, we, we, I'm not interested in, in, in your old talks. I want a new one. So actually, he kind of stimulated me to, to uh, create a new talk, which is about uh, debugging distributed systems. Uh, as it's a new talk, I'm really curious to hear your feedback. So uh, let me know afterwards what you thought of it. Uh, was it good? Was it bad? Was it fun? Was it boring? Uh, any feedback is welcome. So you can reach me at my email address, which is in the screen, or uh, via Twitter. So this talk is called Debugging Distributed Systems, but we might as well call it Networking 101. Or another title might be uh, How the Internet Works. So this talk is mainly going to be about debugging connections between systems. Uh, so we, you probably, if you're all in software development, you know how to debug a, a local machine, but I'm going to talk mostly about when something doesn't work between two machines, how do we know what's wrong and how can we fix this? If you have any questions in between, feel free to ask me in the Q&A. Uh, also, I'm happy to, to hear any uh, remarks or questions through the uh, chat. So feel free to let me know through the chat that you are there. I see that Simon is there, Rolf, Marcus, and Michael. So thanks for joining and let's get started. So let's start with why. It's always important to start with why. Why this talk? Why am I? Why do I want to talk about deep breaking distributed systems? Well, I'd say that because I'm almost sure that almost all of you are in some way working on or building or designing or architecting distributed systems. Uh, I believe microservices is the popular term for them uh, now. And even if you're developing a front end, it's still a distributed system because you are uh, building something that runs in a browser and this browser fetches HTML or, or JavaScript from some other server. So, so you, you still have multiple um, um, systems involved that exchange information. So my name is Bert-Jan Schrijver. I work at Open Value. We are a Java consultancy with offices in the Netherlands, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So we recently started in Zurich. Uh, I also run the NLJUG, which is the Netherlands Java user group. So I'm really happy to talk at one of our uh, uh, sister jugs uh, in, uh, in another country. So hello, Daniel. Thanks for joining. Hello, Ursula. Hello, Thomas. So the next, let's say, 45 minutes or so, we're going to dive into a couple of different uh, topics. So let we start with why, but we already did this. So the next one is what? What what are distributed systems? What I'm going to talk about? Why are distributed systems difficult? Difficult to design, difficult to to build, difficult to debug. And we'll we'll go into some some basics of networking, like how does how does networking work? So the first part, or be it the left part of this slide, is mainly about uh, theory, uh, because you can only fix something that you that you can understand, right? So the second part of the talk is, is more hands-on. So I'll share a structured, a somewhat structured approach that I like to use to, to tackle these types of, of uh, problems. I'll do a couple of demos. Uh, I'll uh, hope to have time in the end to share a couple of war stories of problems with distributed systems. And obviously every story needs an end. So 
um, there will be a conclusion as well. So let's let, let's focus a bit on, on debugging as a topic. So debugging has different levels of complexity. So the first one is debugging a system that doesn't have concurrency. So it's a system that's only doing one thing, uh, a local system that's only doing one thing at the same time. And then the second level is a system that's concurrent. So you're doing something with threads or streams or multiple things run at the same time. And then you get a whole new plethora of possible bugs or things that can go wrong because when two things are happening at the same time, you have troubles with, I don't know, um, uh, stuff that's happening at the same time and mutating the same piece of data, for example. And then there's the third level of complexity for debugging, and this is distribution. So why, is, why are distributed applications hard? Because you, you, you add another uh, difficulty, which is that there are uh, two, two um, components running concurrent. So you have the same as level two, they're running concurrent, but they're also running in different places and there's a network connection in between. So you get all the benefits benefits you have from level two and added to this, the extra complexity of different locations with a network connection in between. So let's start with what? What, what is a distributed system? So I remember learning this in university and finding it boring at the time uh, because, well, I didn't really find it necessary to spread a system out over multiple uh, computers. Whereas this is basically all I've been doing for the past 10 years, right? So building distributed systems, microservices that run on the cloud or run on Kubernetes. Uh, so but, but what is the definition? Well, if you need a definition, you can always ask Wikipedia. So here we see a couple of people who you could see as a distributed system because they are jumping out of a plane together and falling to the earth. Uh, but they are doing this together. And they probably also have some communication between them because they're holding hands and probably they need to make some different patterns in the air. So a distributed system is a system where components are located on different network computers and they communicate and coordinate by passing messages. Okay, so we have at least two components. They are connected by a network and they talk to each other by passing messages. That, that's what a distributed system is. So if you would have two microservices that exchange uh, REST calls between each other, it's a distributed system. If you look at a browser and the browser fetches HTML from a remote server, it's a distributed system. If you look at a Kafka client and a Kafka uh, broker, uh, they're a distributed system. If you generalize enough, anything that's on different computers that are networked that communicate with each other is a distributed system. So what are typical characteristics of, of distributed systems? How can you recognize them? What, what do you get? So this one we already discussed, right? You have concurrency of components. So different pieces run concurrent. You have a lack of a global clock. So if you run everything on one system, all applications on this system use the same clock. If you run on different systems, you don't have a global, global clock. You might synchronize uh, time between servers, but they will never be exactly the same. And this can be a problem in systems where you rely on reliable clocks to synchronize data, for example, or to measure things. So if you want to measure how long a request between two servers takes, but the server ha servers have 200 millisecond time difference, then you can already not measure this in a, in a safe way. Um, you mainly see this with systems that are synchronizing data in, in some way where you have a, a, a problems with a lack of a global clock. And, and components can fail independent of each other. I'd say this is both a good thing and a bad thing. So if you have a, a microservices application where you have, uh, I don't know, 100 components, then it's nice that one of them can fill independently and the other 99 will keep running. On the other hand, it's also make sure that you need to, to search between 100 services to, to find out which, which is the one that's failing. And since you have cascading failures, one component fails and then the other fails, it might be even harder to, to look at. And as a reason of, of, of these things, Distributed systems are um, harder to, to reason about. Uh, they are harder to fit in your mind. They are harder to, to, uh, to think about when, when things go wrong. So as uh, Martin Kletman says, Martin is the author of a, uh, well, I'd say fairly famous book about designing data intensive applications. And he says that working with distributed systems is fundamentally different compared to writing software that runs on a single computer. And, and the main difference is that there are lots of new and exciting ways for things to go wrong. So why do things go wrong if we are building distributed systems? I say that one reason is that we tend to make uh, false assumptions about how the world works. 
how our system works or even better how, how networks work because well we're developers right we we focus on writing code and code write, runs on, on a single computer and then well maybe needs to talk to to somebody else's code but well that's not our problem so this was described by a couple of people who used to work at certain microservices as the fallacies of distributed computing so you could see these as uh, misconceptions of uh, of, of uh, people who are working with distributed computing. So they were made by Al Peter Deutsch and a couple of others describing uh, well, false assumptions that uh, programmers make who start working with distributed applications. And I've probably made all of, all of these errors lots of times. So let's have a look at them. The network is reliable. You can always trust the network. There's no latency. There's infinite bandwidth. The network is always secure. The topology of the network doesn't change. There's only one admin. The transport cost is zero and the network is homogeneous. Well, obviously these are all wrong, right? So, so let's, let's start again and see why they are wrong. Can you trust a network? Well, if I look at my home network, typically it works fine, but sometimes maybe there's, I don't know, a mouse who, who bites in a cable or a cable gets this, this, uh, disconnected or somebody trips over a cable and one wire becomes loose. Uh, if you have an internet connection at home, then typically this is not always up. Maybe it's, it's down for, I don't know, a couple of hours per month, but, but still you cannot guarantee that it's always up. You always have some sort of latency, even with two computers connected directly, the latency might be low, but it can be, uh, it can be increasingly uh, bigger if you need to travel over longer distances. If you are connecting to a server on the other side of the world, probably you get at least 10, 20, 30 milliseconds of latency, and maybe even more, maybe it's 200 milliseconds. So why, why is this a problem? Because, well, everybody can wait 200 milliseconds, right? But or if you need to make a thousand requests, then 200 milliseconds uh, become a lot longer and it's not something you want to wait on. Bandwidth is infinite. So we can always download big files, send big files, doesn't really matter. Well, I'd say that this, this is becoming less and less true, le uh, less and less false, I'd say, because uh, we, we have pretty big internet connections nowadays in, 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 in most broadband connections that you can get. Uh, but still, we have also mobiles and, and, and 3G or 4G or 5G connections with limited bandwidth. So this is something you need to take into account when you are sending big amounts of data. The network is secure. Um, can be relatively secure, but uh, it always highly depends on, well, first, uh, how, how uh, secure is it defined in software? In software, does somebody manage to break into one of your network routers or into your switch or your VPN concentrator? And secondly, also think about physical security. So uh, Google was famous for building fairly secure data centers, and they were secured physically and also in software pretty well. And then the NSA wanted to um, basically eavesdrop on, on communication in Google's data centers. But they found a different way to do this. So they didn't go to the data centers, but they went right in the middle between two data centers. So this was a, a submarine cable that was lying somewhere in the beach or in front of the beach. They dug up the cable. Uh, it was a fiber cable. They cut it in half, put a device in there, and connected again. And Google didn't really notice. They noticed a short drop in, in connectivity. Uh, but it was restored shortly after, and then the NSA could tap in all the communication between data centers. So they weren't secured by then, uh, so the NSA had, had access to this data. Um, but in the end, Google uh, managed to secure those connections, so then it didn't really matter anymore. Network topology doesn't change. So once you've, I don't know, set up your network and you're, you, you're, you, you know that you have a fast connection to another system, this doesn't change anywhere in the future. It might change. It might that you now have a quick path through a couple of routers to another server, and this server can respond in 10 milliseconds, but maybe uh, one of the routers in between breaks, and you now get the long way around all the way to another country or to another uh, part of the world, and, and the topology of the network is now different. So these are also things that change that can influence um, connections between uh, machines. There's only one administrator, and this administrator configures everything in the same way. Well, uh, for small networks, this might be true, but for any decent sized networks, this won't, be, uh, this won't be true anymore. And you might have different network settings for different components, different uh, MTUs for how big network packets are, different firewall settings. Uh, so when there are multiple administrators, there will typically also be multiple configurations uh, in a network. Transport cost is zero. It doesn't cost you anything to, to transport stuff from one machine to another. 
I'd say this is false for two reasons. It, it costs time to transport stuff. If you need to transfer, I don't know, one terabyte of data, even with a gigabyte connection, it takes time. And it can also cost you money. So if it's your own network, it won't cost you much. But if you run on, let's say, a cloud environment by, by, by Amazon, uh, you are paying for the transport of network data between their, their regions. Within one data center, it's free, but between regions, you, you pay. Uh, so there's also might be a monetary cost to transport of data. And then finally, the network is homogeneous. So everything in the network is the same. If I have a connection of, of one gigabit here, then probably everything will be gigabits. But, well, it might not be the case. It might be that there's one slower connection somewhere in the network, or there's some piece of the network that has more uh, more latency or where there's more packet loss. So also here, uh, the case is that network issues of any sorts will rise in any system that you observe uh, long enough. So knowing that distributed applications are a bit more complex and that we tend to make false assumptions about networks, you might ask yourself, what could possibly go wrong? Well, let's start, let's start with a blast from the past, the OSI model for networks. Um, can you let me know through the chat whether you've heard about the OSI model before? Just type yes, yes or no. And I'll go with introducing it. So, so the, the OSI model is a, a reference model for, for computer networks. And it was designed, I don't know, I think somewhere in the 1970s or something uh, to, to kind of like uh, depict the different layers that a network uh, has. So yes, almost, all body, almost everybody knows the OSI uh, model. Cool. So yes, it is indeed for me also a flashback to university uh, where I learned it. But, but <laughs> the nice thing is that I learned about the OSI model in university, which was like uh, uh, 15 years ago. And then I didn't really look, look into it anymore <clears throat> until I started preparing for this talk, because mostly what we know is TCP IP, uh, the, the protocol we use to, to you know, connect between servers. And this has a, a, a bit less layer. So it starts with <clears throat> the network interface in the bottom, and the network interface basically is the uh, the physical uh, the physical media, so the actual network cables and the Ethernet connection that you have on your local area network. So the the actual uh, um, pieces of either light that are being sent back and forth if you have uh, fiber, or pieces of current that are being sent on copper cables if you have Ethernet. So the next layer is the network layer, which is basically about the Internet protocol and routing. So once once you leave your local network. You, you end up in the, the bigger internet where there are thousands and thousands of routers that will route your packet to the right internet address. Then on top of this, we get the transport layer, which is basically uh, for, for connections between uh, two machines. So once you found a route from one machine to the other, you're going to set up a connection, which can either be a TCP or UDP connection. And then on top of this, we get the application layer where we have protocols like HTTP or DNS or also TLS and SSL for, for encrypting. So why am I giving you this blast from the past about the OSI model and TCP IP? Well, because in, in any of those layers, things can go wrong. If you have a trouble, if you have trouble connecting <clears throat> your laptop to something else, it might be the network cable or, or um, maybe your, your router has some water damage. Then you're in, in, in the network, network layer. It might be a problem with routing. Something is wrong with, with, with BGP or with, uh, uh, I don't know, some core route from the internet, the route of your provider. This might be an issue. It might be in the transport uh, layer. So you cannot get a TCP connection because there's a firewall or you have too much packet loss to, to make a reliable connection. And it can also be in the, in the top layer, like the HTTP request is not right, the DNS is not right, you have a problem with TLS. So it can basically can, can go wrong in all of these layers. And the more you are aware of these things, the easier it becomes to reason about and to not skip any things that, that are wrong. So a famous interview question is, what happens when you type google.com in your browser and you hit enter? So um, think, about, think about for yourself, what's the first thing that happens when you start typing google.com in your browser? Let me know through the chat what the very, very first thing is that happens when you, when you, when you type google.com in your browser. I'll give you some time to, to think about it and to reply in the chat. What's the first thing that happens? Marcus says there's an autocomplete request. 
who was says DNS. Thomas also says DNS. Dimitri says browser sense type characters. Ursula, keyboard event. Yes. So I'm going to, and Urs says DNS lookup. Yes. I'm going to award uh, the prize to Ursula. So when you start typing Google, the first thing that happens is you press, you press the physical key. You press it down. And then depending on whether you have a USB keyboard or you have a PS2 keyboard, is that because of the mechanical connection you make, a small current starts running and triggers something in the keyboard control as a key down event, uh, right? Uh, we're not going to go in this much detail. So we're going to start with most of the things you said, right? That we're going to do a, a DNS uh, call. So I'm going to, <clears throat> to grab my, my notebook here and going to switch my camera. And we're going to um, um, write down what happens when we connect to Google in our browser. So um, <clears throat> we are at home. I'm at home now. And um, <laughs> Igor says that small hobbits will spin the processor of the laptop, which is absolutely correct. Um, I'm at home and I have my laptop here. And I am at typing www.google.com in my laptop. So what happens? First, a couple of things happen on, on my local machine. <clears throat> so the first thing <clears throat> that my browser does is starts parsing the URL. Is there a protocol in there? Is there a domain name in there? Is there a port in there? Is there a, a resource or, or, or a URI uh, part of the URL? Then secondly, if I only type www.google.com, it's going to check my HSTS list. So the strict transport security. Uh, yes, indeed, Marcus, I have, I have four hands. I can write and wave at the same time. Uh, if there's HSTS, we're going to go to uh, HTTPS uh, no matter what. Then we're going to check our DNS cache. So do we uh, have a local entry for www.google.com? Let's say that we don't have it. Then we're going to query the DNS server. And, and now we need to, it's the first time we're going out of the boundary of our own uh, machine. So I'm going to draw the internet boundary. So anything that crosses these dotted lines is going on the internet. So in check two, we probably found www.google.com on in our HSTS uh, list. So our strict transport security list that's that's added in the browser. So we know that we need to go to port 443. And we can now query our uh, local DNS server, which is probably provided by our internet provider, and say, hey, internet provider, give me the DNS uh, um, entry for www.google.com. So our laptop sends a request to the DNS server of our provider. Does our provider know the DNS entry for google.com? Let's assume it doesn't. Then it needs to uh, connect to Google to ask Google's DNS server where this is. So it connects to the um, some of the root servers in DNS that will tell you, okay, for google.com, you need to be in this and this DNS server, which is probably DNS server somewhere in the Google data center. So the Google DNS server replies back and says, well, the IP address for www.google.com is 1.2.3.4. So now my DNS server of my provider knows where it needs to go and it can reply and say, hey, this is the IP address. So now we know which IP address to connect and we know that we need to go to port 443 because it's a, a TLS connection. So now the browser can actually uh, go onto the internet and uh, find the, the IP address. So there's some routing going on that we will skip over, but it, it will start opening a TCP connection on port 443. On for port 443, where? So we can assume that, that Google is big enough that they will have some, some load balancer running somewhere uh, in the edge of the network. So we're going to connect to this load balancer that has the DNS name google.com, has the IP address 1234, make a TCP connection port 443, and on top of this TCP connection, we're going to the next OSI layer, we're going to make a TLS connection. And on top of this TLS or SSL connection, we're going to do an HTTP GET request to get www.google.com. So then the load balancer needs to know where to forward this request. So it's safe to assume that Google has so many uh, uh, data centers and server clusters that they have some sort of service registry where they need to look up where to go for www.google.com. So the service registry replies, well, uh, load balancer, you need to be in some, some kind of Kubernetes cluster. 
So it could be Kubernetes or Borg or whatever Google is running, but there will be some cluster somewhere. So load balancer forwards to the uh, cluster. And there's probably then, and if it's Kubernetes, there's an ingress server there, which forms serves as a load balancer for the cluster. So this ingress also needs to know where to forward the request. So there's probably a service registry there as well. So it asks the service registry, like where, where do we need to go? And it says, well, you need to go to this Kubernetes uh, host. And uh, on this host, there's probably uh, something running that can handle this request. So in case of Kubernetes, probably a, a pod that's there. So then the host forwards the request to the pod and the pod can execute, um, uh, the, the, can give back the results. Probably it needs to fetch some configuration or maybe some search results from the database. So it fetches from the database and then returns the result to the edge of the host, to the ingress, to the load balancer, and then the load balancer can send an HTTP response to our laptop. So we can add a couple of more steps to the steps we already wrote down. So uh, step five after we create the DNS is to connect to the IP address using a TCP connection on, on the, uh, the port that we specified. Then we make the HTTP request. And once we get the response, we need to parse the response and render the HTML in our browser. So all this for a simple request to google.com, right? So I'd say that's quite a lot. So why am I telling you all this? Uh, it's very well possible that, that a lot of you already know this. Uh, because if something doesn't work in you Googling, it could be wrong in, in any of those arrows here, in any of those systems. Uh, so once you have a problem in, in, a, in a system that you are responsible for, it can really help to draw a picture like this because in any of those lines and any of those boxes, something can be wrong. So uh, again, a quote from Martin Kleppmann, and he says that in a distributed systems, there may well be some parts of the system that are broken in some unpredictable way, even though other parts of the system are working fine. It's the same with, with the Google example, right? Most of the things could work, but even, I don't know, if the DNS server of your provider is broken, it, it, it doesn't work. If you fail to set up a TLS connection because your local browser certificates are not up to date, it won't work. If something on the Google side is wrong, it won't work. Um, so th there's typically in a large enough system uh, where you have, let's say, thousands of nodes, it's reasonable to assume that something is always broken. So if you are building distributed systems, it's always it obviously also helps to think a lot about uh, what can what can break, what can be broken, and how does the system respond when things are broken. So you might ask, are we done yet with all this boring theory? Yes, we are done, and we're going to get a bit more practical. So where do you start if you have an issue with your system that you need to debug? Well, I'm going to share a structured, somewhat structured approach of debugging and distributed systems. So this is the approach I've, I've adopted over the years. It's not necessarily the right approach or the best approach. It's just one that works for me that I'm, that I'm sharing with you. So I'm going to mention all the steps uh, now, and then we're going to go in more detail uh, right after to each of the steps. So it started by observing the situation and documenting what you have. Focus on creating something that reprodu can reproduce the problem as quickly as possible. Start looking at the client side. The, and typically in a, in a request response scenario, there's always a client side and a server side. So start with the client side. That's typically the side that we control. Then next, check whether DNS is okay, whether there's a route from client to server. Check whether you can uh, make a connection. Inspect any traffic or messages that are flowing between client and server. Debug it on the server side. And in the end, hopefully you've been able to resolve the problem. Then it's important to wrap up the incident and write a postmortem for uh, future occurrences of similar problems. So let's start with step one. Ask yourself the question, what do I know about the problem? Do you have any user reports? Uh, somebody who told me something, have we seen this problem before? Then start inspecting. Look at any distributed logging you have. Are there errors and errors in there? Do you have any other systems that you can um, uh, consult to see what's going wrong? Do you have any uh, metrics uh, that can say something about response times or, uh, or or latency? Do you have tracing where you can trace a call over multiple requests and see where where it ends? 
and then start drawing. Go in front of a whiteboard or, or, or a piece of paper and draw the path from source to target uh, and draw what's in between. And focus on details here because if you leave one thing out, if you leave one transparent load balancer or one proxy out, uh, this could very well be, be the problem. So focus on details there. Make it as detailed as possible. You don't necessarily need to think about the current that's flowing when you do a key press on your PS2 keyboard, but everything that, that is relevant and is in between there. It's better to have more detail than to skip out on details that might be the cause of the issue. And document what you know. So think about what's in between, routers, firewalls, proxies, load balancing. And documenting helps uh, building insight because once you're writing down, it can also help you to uh, get, get more insights on what's going on. It forms a sort of, sort of way of a rubber duck, duck debugging, but it also helps uh, to is a, 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 a basis for transferring knowledge if you need to get other people on the problem. Uh, if you haven't written anything down, then you need to explain the entire problem from beginning to end to everybody who joins. If you document from the beginning, it's easier to onboard uh, other people and, and also to structure things. And think about whether can, can you reproduce the problem in a test? Because once you can, can reproduce something in a test, then it's typically fairly doable to fix. Then it's not really debugging a distributed issue anymore, but you're just debugging locally. For example, by injector error, injecting error. So there are there are tools like um, uh, Jepson where you can inject errors in communication between services. So this is not always easy, but if you can reproduce a problem in a test, it can definitely help. And the result might be something like this, right? So you describe, okay, what's going on? What's the client? Uh, what's the service? Uh, what's the server? What's in between? And what are, what are we doing? And which pieces and parts are uh, involved? Next step is create a minimal reproducer. So what is a mini minimal reproducer? Uh, now, well, the goal is to maximize the amount of debugging cycles and feedback loops you can do. So if you have a problem, and this problem um, only manifests itself after you've clicked through an application for 10 minutes, then it takes at least 10 minutes for you to try a solution, right? Because you try something, then you need to click for 10 minutes. Oh, it doesn't work. Try something else. Click for 10 minutes. Okay. So the goal is to get 10 minutes down to 10 seconds or, or even lower uh, so that you can try as often as possible. So this could be something that you, you, you need to log in to the source machine, for example, or that you have something like a real small reproducer, like a single, single uh, a Java application that you can deploy or a jar or a shell script. Or, or a curl command, the quicker you can get feedback loops and try, the, 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 the more um, tries you have at finding out what the problem is. So focus on short development iterations and quick feedback loops. Try to get close to the action. By this, I mean that if you have a server and the server needs to connect to another server and uh, this doesn't work, then it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make much sense to, to try to connect to the other server from your local laptop because it's this server that has the problem. So in this case, I would try to log in to the source machine and try it from this machine if I can reach the other machine. So try to get as close to the actual action and problem as possible because this will help you uh, to, uh, to reproduce the problem uh, uh, in a stable way uh, earlier. So whenever I, 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 I sit down next to, body, next to somebody who's debugging a problem and uh, getting the problem to manifest itself take more than, let's say, one minute, I first try to focus on, okay, let's get this minute down to like 10 seconds so we can try six times in a minute instead of one time in a minute. So then the next step is to um, focus on eliminating any errors that, that could happen on the client side. So think about what can be wrong. Are we going to, to the right remote host? Are we connecting to the right host? Or, or do we connect to a test system while we, we, we actually should be connecting to production? Do we send the right, uh, the right message? And do we receive a response uh, at all? Um, and and I, try to, I will try to um, get information about the requests and responses you are sending as close as possible to the network boundary. So maybe you can find a way to log any outgoing messages and incoming messages um, in, in its purest form. So before there's, I don't know, marshalling going on from, 
from Jackson in your Spring application or something, because because every transformation you do on on the request that's going out and the message that's coming back uh, might be part of the problem. So I'd say that that debugging the client side uh, is not that much different from from local debugging any application, right? So you're just basically uh, making sure that you know that the problem is not on on the client side, and not until you're sure about this, then you can move on. Uh, to the the next step to debug the work either network connection or the server side and then well as as most of you uh, mentioned in uh, when i asked about uh, the um uh, what's going to happen when you type google is it it start with dns so the domain name system maps names to ip addresses right and and in surprisingly many cases dns is in some way involved in being part of the problem so it starts with making sure that you know what IP address the host name should resolve to uh, by, I don't know, talking to the person who owns this server or by validating this another way. And then the second step is to verify that, that this actually happens at the client. If the client goes to server.domain.com, uh, will this actually resolve to the correct IP? Or maybe did server.domain.com get a new DNS entry somewhere in 24 past hours and the client is still caching the old IP address? So how do you do this? Uh, well, there are, there are lots of tools you can use to debug DNS. So let's say that we want to know something about the um, uh, jug.ch um, uh, domain. So uh, for example, we can use uh, host, and we can say host uh, jug.ch. And then we say that, okay, the IP address is, uh, is this, and maybe the www goes to the same IP. Okay, but uh, who, who responds to us with this IP now? It's probably either my local cache or it's the uh, DNS server of my provider. So I would like to find out what is the IP of jug.ch at the alternative source. Source. So then I need to find out uh, either by using who is. So with you, who is, you can ask which are the name servers that are attached to uh, jug.ch. So it's it's telling us here that well we we cannot request it in this way. So let's go to the website and see what's, what we can find there. We go to this site, and then I want to uh, find out what is jerk.ch. So the name servers are these three, ch.pro.io. Okay, so now I can say host jerk.ch and ask it at the authoritative source. So now I'm pretty sure that, okay, this server, which according to the Whois information is the owner or the primary name server in this domain saying is this IP. A nice tool you can use for this is um, nslookup.io. This is a tool developed by uh, Ruud Jan Pot, who I met at a meetup uh, a while ago. Uh, and this automates some of the work that I, that I did here. So if I'm finding the DNS records, uh, in this case, I'm saying, okay, it's, uh, it's this IP according to Cloudflare, Cloudflare DNS. So if I go to Google DNS, it's saying it's the same. If you go to Open DNS, it's saying it's the same. If I go to the authoritative DNS, then it will probably query the same server that I tried. Uh, it's saying it's the same. And there's even can try local DNS in different countries, which will probably query some DNS server running somewhere, in this case, in the Netherlands. It's also saying it's this IP. So I'm pretty sure it's this IP. But it might be that uh, since DNS, is, DNS uses uh, a hierarchy and extended caching, that in some parts of the world, it still resolves to the old address, while in some parts, it resolves to the new address. So always be wary of um, uh, caching in, in DNS situations. Um, so with DNS, you have different types of records. And one fun record is... Um, the text record where you can basically enter any text in in uh, uh, in a domain. So let's see, jug.ch has a text record that is a uh, sender protection framework message, which is probably for, for sending emails on the mailing list. But if we go to dns.google, which is an existing domain, so this has uh, 8844 and 8888, which are the primary DNS servers of Google you can use. And if we look at the text records, we see something interesting. It has a link to an XKCD uh, comic in the text record. So, okay, let's, let's look this up. This is actually a comic about uh, Google 
uh, making their DNS service their core project. So probably some of the engineers that were building DNS.google found this a funny XKCD and included it as a text record in the, in the Google DNS. Okay, so we have DNS. So we are going to uh, verify that the IP address actually resolves to the right host. And if necessary, we will verify this with the actual authoritative source. And if there's a difference between what our machine thinks it is and what the authoritative source thinks it is, then we need to find out what the problem is. And this is typically some caching somewhere, either on the local machine or in a local DNS server. So once we know that we can trust DNS, we then, we then now have the IP address for the machine we're trying to reach. And now we can try whether we can actually reach this uh, machine. So we are now still on the uh, network level of, of OSI and TCP. So we're not going to make a TCP connection yet, but we're going to find out, can we actually reach uh, the target machine? So how do we do this? Well, we can start by using ping. Okay, so we get a ping back, so then we can be probably be fairly sure that the machine responds. So a ping sends an ICMP packet, which travels to all the routers between uh, me and the jerk.ch server and responds back when it feels uh, like it. Um, so we uh, can also see if we can use traceroute to find a route from here to jerk.ch. And it's saying it's traveling to uh, 192.168.21. Let me run it on another server, so it probably will be a bit quicker. Yes, so if that renders on my Linux box, it's saying, okay, I'm going to my security gateway, which is this IP. This IP I know is my um, uh, home uh, internet connection modem. Then this one isn't responding in time. Then we're going through this one, which looking by the name is probably a server in Hilversum, which is close to where I live. Then we're going probably to ASD will be Amsterdam, this Amsterdam as well. Uh, I don't know who owns this IP, but we can find out. So this is also owned by Cello Broadband in, in Amsterdam. And do we have any descriptions here? No, not really. And then we're going to this IP. So there's a Zur here. So this might be Zurich. And then we can find out what this IP, who owns this IP. And this is customer addresses in uh, Switzerland. And then the final one is probably uh, the IP address of the machine itself. Yes. So now we're pretty sure that we can reach this machine. And we also know somewhat about the route it travels. So it goes from my machine to Hilversum to Amsterdam, uh, and probably to the MSX, which is the Amsterdam Internet Exchange, somewhere going to uh, to Zurich and through there to the uh, the final server in the end. So um, in the chat, you can see that Patrick um, gave a remark about that you can check DNS propagation with a service. So let's check it out. So here you can indeed see the, let me make it a bit, a bit, a bit bigger. You can see where it's propagated over different uh, locations. So these all have the same address. If we would now make a change in the uh, www.jug.ch uh, DNS record, then probably it would take a while for them all to uh, empty their caches and to uh, uh, to get the new record. So. Um, if um, if you're using a DNS caching service like uh, Google, so if you've used the Google DNS service, then you're also using the Google uh, DNS cache. Uh, and uh, there's a problem in the cache there, and you can go to Google's DNS site, and you can ask it to flush the cache for jerk.ch. So now we'll remove this from the cache, so any subsequent uh, records will um, uh, be uh, refreshed in, in the Google DNS cache. And we have the same for OpenDNS. If you happen to use OpenDNS, then there's also a cache check. If we can go there, we can also check the uh, jerk.ch. And then it will it will return what the value is IP addresses in different countries. So even if people in, in this case, I don't know, uh, Paris have a different IP, then it's something you can see uh, here. So be, be aware that, that in all these places, the address is cached. So Whenever you change something, it could take a while for this to propagate. 
All right, we're continuing because we have now verified that we have the right IP address and that we can reach the target machine by a ping or a trace route. So then we need to check whether we can uh, connect to the uh, target machine. So can we connect uh, to the port uh, by using a tool like Telnet or, or Netcat? So let's, uh, let's look at this. So uh, I'm going to, um, let's see, going to see if we can connect to jerk.ch port 80. So we, we connect, so, so then it's work. What if we connect to port 81? Now it says trying, which typically means that either it cannot reach the host or it's firewalled. So a firewall has typically two ways to, um, to um, well, basically keep you out of the door. It can either be a reject or drop. So if the firewall does a reject, then you get the connection refused, like we saw here. Um, let's go to a non-existing port on my home server. It's saying connection refused. So this means there's nothing running there, but there's there's also no, not a firewall there. In this case, if I'm connecting to jerk.ca port 81, we're not getting a reply, which means that it's firewalled and that the packets are dropped. So you also don't really know whether there's something running there or not. You only know that you cannot open a TCP connection. So Telnet is a tool you can use here. Uh, Netcat is also a tool you can use. So I can say Netcat, jerk.ch80, and make it a bit more verbose. So it says, OK, connection succeeded. If we go to port 81, then it's not saying anything, which basically means I cannot, uh, cannot connect. So if you connect, uh, let's say that we're going to Telnet to jerk.ch port 80. And you can also try see like, okay, does the connection open? Yes, it opens, and does it stay open? Sometimes it closes after a second or something. In this case, it stays open, and we can basically make an HTTP request. And we get an HTTP 301 uh, return that we need to be at HTTPS, uh, and it says move permanently. But now we at least we know that we can make a TCP connection on this port to this server. Let's see what happens if we go to port 443. TLS port. Not saying, hey, this is a bad request. You're sending a plain HTTP request to the HTTPS port. So in this case, we know, okay, we, we should send an HTTPS request uh, to this port, but we can still connect. So we know that TCP wise on this level, we're able to make a connection and that the problem must be somewhere on the application layer. So either in, in TLS or in HTTP. So we can exclude anything else that's below. The routing is working, the firewall is okay. We don't have any physical network errors. We're on all the way at the top of the OSI model or the TCP IP model. So we already went through this, this connection open and stay open. Are we talking TLS or not? Uh, so in this case, we were connecting to a TLS port, but we're not. we were not talking TLS. Another interesting thing to find out is what is the connection speed between us? Uh, so if you have two servers and you suspect that they are slow, uh, how do you find out? Well, you can do a uh, you can do a, like an, an internet speed test on on any of those. So in this case, I'm do, going to do a uh, a curl a curl to the uh, University of Twente uh, website and uh, see what happens. And well, I'm downloading now with seventy three megabyte per second, which if we calculate is um, 584 megabits, which is which is fine, I'd say. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if two servers have a fast connection to the internet, that they have a fast connection to each other. So to do this, you can use a tool called uh, Perf, I, iPerf actually. So I'm here on, on server, server one, which is one of my home Linux boxes. I can start iPerf uh, and I started in the server mode. Now I go to one of my other servers. And I say iperf uh, client and go to 192.186.22. Uh, and it's not working, but I'm not using the right client. Now it's connected. So now the bit rate is on both sides, 940 uh, mega, megabits per second. So it's, it's doing this for like 10 seconds. And now I get a report. And uh, well, uh, we get a report that there's a 941 megabits on this side and also on this side, which sounds fine because it's a gigabit switch that's in between and these boxes are right next to each other. 
So uh, Stefan has have has flashbacks to an incident with uh, TCP handshake problems uh, because clock offset. Well, yes, typically there are also uh, some some timing is uh, uh, involved when when you're validating uh, TLS uh, certificates. Uh, and if if, if like uh, there, there's a small difference, then well, you might be okay. If there's a bigger difference, and it might be even the case that one of the sites thinks that the other certificate is uh, is expired. So um, we looked at uh, doing speed checks using iperf. And what, what happens from time to time um, is that uh, if you're working in cloud environments, that uh, something like this happens. So uh, you should be able to connect to a server and uh, it, all the firewall rules should be fine, but for some reason it doesn't work. Uh, so in my experience, um, it, it's always interesting to first try uh, hitting it with a hammer, which basically means rebooting the machine. So I've experienced this both in OpenStack and on AWS, a server where anything, everything looked okay. It didn't, re didn't respond to network re requests, reboot the machine. <clears throat> so it reinitializes the network stack and then see whether it comes back up again and whether you can connect. So a colleague of mine <laughs> used to uh, use the phrase, I call this boot is immer good. So remember this, if you cannot connect to a cloud machine, uh, first try rebooting. It's a bit of a, of a big uh, of a big hammer to hit the problem with, but uh, in some cases it might, it might help. All right, so we've been here, we've checked the connection speed. So now it's time to inspect the traffic and the messages. So we, now we know that we can connect, that we can set up a TCP connect, that there's routing, we can set up a TCP connection, that we can talk uh, over the wire. So the only thing now that might be wrong is that we're not sending the right message, right? So do we send the right request? Well, this is something that we can also uh, investigate at the client side, but something that we could also investigate at the server side, like which, which request is coming in. Do we receive the right response? Is the response we're ex expecting or is it something else? How do we know that we're sending the right request and the right response? Uh, by looking as close as possible to the network boundary, what is going out and what's coming in. How do we handle TLS? Do we need to do anything with, with uh, um, uh, client certificates or TLS validation? Uh, this is typically a bit harder to debug because well, you cannot really uh, see what's going over the wire because it's encrypted, uh, right? And are there any load balances or proxies in between? So load balances and proxies are notorious for not letting through specific kinds of communication. So they might have problems with stateful stuff like, uh, let's say, WebSockets, or they might uh, insert or remove any HTTP headers because they have their own way of handling these uh, these things. So how do we know that we send the right request and the right response? Well, we're going to debug uh, a bit more. So uh, let's say that we're going to uh, make requests to, uh, well, let's say the, the open value web server. So say we do a curl and we go to uh, HTTP, Open value of it now. Okay, then we get a move permanently. So we need to be somewhere else. So where where else do we need to be? Okay, we need to be. We look at the headers that we get in response. Then we say, okay, it's saying uh, location open value of now. So we need to be at HTTPS. So let's see if he can find out the same thing uh, if we are on the server side. So let me log into the web server. And let's see if we can, uh, in this case, sniff the traffic that's happening on uh, port 80. So I'm going to open a TCP dump. And I'm going to make it verbose. And we're going to listen it to uh, TCP port 80. Okay. So yes, here we are. So uh, we're seeing here the request. And uh, we're seeing here the response that we're sending. Because, well, this is unencrypted, right? This is being sent in, in the open uh, to the server. So if we, uh, if I would tell net to it, and then say get slash HP 1.1, then probably this is also something we'll see appear here. Yes, here it is. And then I say um, host openvary.nl and send a request. Then we can see the request flying back and forth here. So TCP dump is something you can use to inspect this type of traffic. But once we go to HTTPS, then it becomes harder, right? So if we go to HTTPS, uh, 
then we still get a, a response because it wants us to go to openvalue.eu. But if I would look at TCP port 443 now, then we won't be able to see the data that's flowing there because, well, it's uh, it's encrypted. So then you could do something like um, uh, if, if, if there's a TLS termination, um, so there's a web server terminating TLS and then forwarding to a local port 8080 or something, you can try to listen on this port. Or if you really, really want to, you can try to um, go um, on, on the client side, make some man-in-the-middle proxy that you put in between your client and your server that will decode and re-encode TLS. This is a bit of a pain, but, but it might be necessary if you need to debug TLS uh, problems. So um, let's see. Ah, yeah. So something that's also interesting is if you're uh, like opening a website, let's go to the open value website. And let's say that something here is not working, then a neat trick is to uh, inspect the network uh, tab, make a request. And let's say that we have a problem with, uh, I don't know, some piece of uh, CSS that we're loading. Uh, so you can actually, in I think in both Firefox and Chrome, you can say copy and I say copy as curl. So if there's anything going wrong here, then you can copy it as a curl request, put it in your console, and then it will send the exact request that your browser was sending. So, well, we get the CSS back in return here, right? But we can also change something like, I don't know, uh, change uh, the if modified uh, since and, uh, and see what that happens. So this is a nice way of quickly iterating on requests that your browser is doing and changing small things uh, where you don't need to instruct your browser, but you can just do it with, with a curl client. Then step seven, if all else fails. So if we haven't been able to find out any problems in the traffic that we're sending between client and server, then we can start debugging uh, server side. I pushed the wrong button, but now I'll push the right one. So, uh, well, we need to start inspecting the uh, remote host um, and, and see, well, what, what can we do there? Do we any, have any ways to debug uh, this? Is it possible to attach a remote debugger? So if it's Java application, probably you can. Uh, you, you might need to do some work to, to be able to log into the server, uh, but, but you might be able to do so. So if you're interested in remote debugging, I'm not going to tell you here, but my colleague Wolfgang uh, told a nice story about this. Um, so you can find it in our YouTube channel. Uh, you can try to do profiling. So you can attach a profiler if something is being slow. Uh, or you can attach a Linux debugger. And this is a neat trick that I would like to show you. So with S-Trace, you can connect to any uh, Linux process and kind of look into it to see what it's doing. For example, if it's blocked or waiting on anything. Uh, so we're going to uh, connect to the uh, HTTP process on our server since we couldn't uh, inspect the TLS uh, stuff, right? So if you we were making a uh, curl request to... Um, um, to the to the HTTP URL, then we would be able to to find uh, whatever was going on there. So um, I am uh, logged in to the uh, web server, and I want to see what what TLS requests are being sent here. So let me find out on which um, I'm using nginx here on which port nginx is running, which process ID nginx is running. So there's an nginx worker process here. So I can connect with S trace minus PID and then connect to this uh, mm -hmm. port. Okay. Now, if you do a request, then I will see everything flying by here. So it's going to uh, find this uh, directory, this PHP file. So let me make a correct request. That's not redirecting anymore. Okay. So now it's actually sending the HTML here. So I'm doing a TLS request here, but I can still read the contents that are being sent. And even if I, uh, say that it needs to uh, show longer strings, then probably I can see the entire uh, request is being sent back and forth. Let me try again because somebody else came in between. So where are we? These are the binaries. This is the HTML and the request will be somewhere here as well. Well, it's because I'm sending all these binaries that it's a bit hard to search in. So I should be able to find the HTTP request here somewhere. This is the HTTP response. And let's try again. Oh yeah, so here it's saying, this is, yeah, this is actually saying slash get, get slash HTTP 2.0, curl, 
and then uh, uh, that was the um, uh, the response that we uh, the request that we sent. So even with S trace, you might be able to get some more details on on whatever is going wrong in uh, on your server. So then, obviously, it's also important to wrap up and to do uh, to 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 note down what went wrong. So you can uh, document the issue by writing down the timeline, what happened when, what did you see, why did this happen, what was the impact of the problem, how did you find out what the problem was or that there was a problem, and uh, what did we do to mitigate and fix the problem, and in the end also what should we do to prevent repetition. So my advice is to always do this with any non-trivial issue you have, because this allows you afterwards to structure your thoughts, but also to document whatever happened and how you approach this, and this allows you also to share the issue with others, like if the project manager wants to know what happened or, or the architect or somebody else. So I'd say this can really help you to, um, um, structure in a structured way, write down whatever happened uh, in a problem and, and how you can prevent doing this, ha happening this another time in the future. So Jason Cahoon, who I think I is from the uh, infrastructure engineering a side that Google says, so if you really want a reliable system, you have to understand the failure mode. So if you have to actually have witnessed it misbehaving. So I have a couple of war stories that I like to share. Uh, how are we time-wise, uh, Patrick? And do I have a couple of minutes uh, to spare? Of course. How, how many minutes do I have? Just take your time. I think okay. war stories are anyway the, the best thing, right? People will remember and... Uh... It's fun. So okay, good. Well, I'll, I'll take my time. I'll, I'll just uh, tell tell a couple ones. So um, there's this one where where we had a problem and this worked half of the time. So it was uh, a a a piece of functionality where and I want you all to think along, like to think if you can come up with what the problem is and how we can can solve this. So this was a piece of functionality where we would I think generate a PDF. And then we would send back a link to the browser where you could download to generate a PDF. So what would happen is the, the team would come to me, can you help? We have a problem. Uh, so this functionality works about half of the time. So, okay, that's interesting. Uh, so I, I checked it and I tried it like 10 times. And indeed, five times I got the result back and five other times I didn't get the result back. Uh, so, well, uh, any ideas on what can be wrong? Let me know through the chat what the problem could be. It works exactly about exactly half of the time we get a PDF back, and the other half of the time we get a, I don't know a not found or something back. We we cannot find the PDF that we're downloading. Any ideas on what the problem could be? Race condition, some timeout, says Dimitri. Uh, it was well, you might be able to call it race condition because it was not race, but it was probably not a race condition. So low balancer, one machine working, one not, two servers, one wrong configured. Yes, you're all. Pretty much right. Um, it, it wasn't a configuration issue, so the, the servers were working fine. The problem was that we uh, we were running on two servers, and this application was not stateless. So what it would do is request one, it would generate the PDF, write it to disk because that's how the PDF generation worked, and then it would send the second request. And with this request, you would request it, but it, only if you would end up in the right server, you would get the PDF back, and otherwise, it wouldn't be there. So I think we solved this by making this into one request. So you would always retrieve it directly after generating from, from the same server. Alexander says it's DNS. Yes, it's it's often DNS. Uh, it could have been DNS. In this case, it, it, it wasn't. So uh, the next one is from um, uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine Beaumont. And she spent hours debugging two microservices and they wouldn't talk to each other. Uh, in this case, it was a problem that one of them was doing a put and the server was expecting a post. So uh, in this case, if you go all the way to step one, where I said, okay, write down what you know and observe, then hopefully the looking very well at the logging would uh, inform you of this error message saying, hey, we don't uh, support a post here, uh, but they should be doing a put. So then there's the one with expecting um, logging expensive logging. So I've, I've seen this in multiple occasions where, uh, well, you're running in a cloud environment and you want to know a lot about how your application is running. So you just log whatever you want. You, lo you write logs to your logging system. You write um, metrics to your metric system. For example, AWS, you write loads and loads of things to, to CloudWatch. 
And the result is, there are two results. There's so much data that nobody's going to look at it. And secondly, you end up paying a lot for all those logging and metrics. So I remember that we, we could only hold maybe a couple of weeks of logging because then otherwise it would go over the size limit of the logging system we were using. Or uh, I remember a project where we were doing stuff with, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's the hosted uh, Spark of um, AWS. It's called Glue, AWS Glue. And we would log minor things to, to CloudWatch. But in the end, we end up with a huge CloudWatch bill because we were processing so much data that even those minor things would end up terabytes of logging in, in uh, CloudWatch. And the same is with, with data transfer. So in the same project, we had an issue where uh, we had put our data on S3 in one region. And then the data scientist was using Athena, which is a way to query Amazon S3 in another region. So for every query they would do, we would accrue data transfer costs between those two regions, which ended up becoming fairly expensive uh, as well. And then the one that is cool. Uh, and now, <laughs> now some of you are going to be right. So I was working for an educational publisher and we were building e-learning systems uh, there. And um, in these e-learning systems, uh, we were building fairly scalable stuff. So the front end will run on the browser, the back end will run on AWS, will be scalable. We'd have scalable databases and we would use, a, I think, a content delivery network for sending out like images and videos, et cetera. So we thought that we would we would have like amazing performance, which usually was all right. Uh, until that time when a school complained that that the images uh, that they uh, that we were loading in the lesson, so it would be a browser window with a lesson that would load lots of images with lesson content. The images were loading really slowly or not at all. And we we're like, okay, that's strange. We're running on AWS on, on, on CloudFront. This should be super performing. So, okay, it's probably the school that has a bad internet connection. We, we were asking, like, okay, uh, do you do you have like a, a good internet connection? Yeah, yeah, sure. Here are our speed test results. And he had like 500 megabits or something. So it was pretty fast. I'm like, okay, that's weird. So we, we put a small box uh, there that will measure the internet connection. This was all fine. But they still said, like, uh, we still have the problem. Your system is behaving slow. So, uh, from my perspective, my system was really fast, but they were experiencing it slow. So I was like, okay, what's, what's the issue? Uh, so I uh, I went over there to the school and uh, talked to their system administrator and he was like, okay, yeah, so let me show you the problem. He got a kit from the class and they were bringing their iPad and showing, okay, I'm now loading the lesson. And indeed these images would really load slow or load not at all, but only the images, like the, the lessons would be fine. So I'm like, that's weird. So I'm like, uh, how many clients do you have here? And it says, yeah, like 3,000 or something. Uh, and they're all slow. Yeah, they're all slow. Okay, weird. So, okay, uh, I started investigating. And, and I started with, with well, step one, writing down. Step two, DNS, right? So I, uh, I made a DNS request. I, I hooked my laptop up to the network, made a DNS request. And it took like a couple of seconds to get a response. I'm like, that's strange. DNS should not take a couple of seconds. So I made another DNS re request. And it took like 10 seconds for a response to come. So I'm like, okay, so it's probably DNS. So I asked this person, like, what, what, what's, what uh, DNS servers are you using? DNS servers of your provider? No, no, we have two providers um, and we, we alternate over them. So we can't use DNS server by provider. So we use Google DNS. So I'm like, okay, so Google DNS should not really have a problem with, with handling 3,000 uh, clients, right? Um, but then I thought like, okay, but 3,000 clients going out on the internet on the same IP address outgoing might be something that Google sees as some like, I don't know, Adidas or something. So then I started uh, uh, reading a bit and I found that Google DNS had a non-documented feature where it would rate limit uh, connections if you would make lots and lots and lots of DNS requests there. So then I said, okay, let's try something else. Let's let's switch to uh, OpenDNS because I knew that OpenDNS didn't have this, this rate limiting. So uh, they went to the, their DHCP server, configured the OpenDNS DNS servers, and then went back. So uh, then I was making DNS requests on my machine. It was pretty fast. So I said, okay, get the same girl that we have from the class, get it in and let me show. So she showed it and it was still slow. I said, ah, no, how can this be? And then I thought, okay, well maybe the DNS settings on her iPad are still going to Google DNS, which indeed was the case. So, okay, 
So turn off Wi-Fi, turn on Wi-Fi, we'd get a new DHCP leash, we'd get the new DNS servers, and then it was lightning fast. And she was scrolling to it again, it was loading and loading, and, and there was no waiting time at all. So the, the, the uh, uh, system administrator was like, ah, I'm getting goosebumps, this is so cool. Uh, so uh, yes, it was indeed zero days since the problem was DNS. So Alexander was right, it was DNS. Um, so in this case, um, uh, it was something completely unrelatable to the systems we were we unrelated to the system we were building. Our systems were performing fine, but since they had a local setup where they were using Google DNS for three thousand clients that had some sort of rate limiting, our system appeared slow from their perception. So I think I have uh, two more. So this one was uh, contributed by uh, Stefan Norbreis, who's actually in the chat uh, now. So he said that there was an issue where um, uh, there was uh, uh, all customers in the Netherlands uh, experience some 500 error codes. So even with like 3,000 customers per second, this was kind of a bit of a problem. And it happened a couple of days in a row when the load started to pick up. And uh, it had happened before, like a couple of days before and a month before, but they didn't really follow up uh, on it. And the monitoring didn't show anything, and the, well, all the synthetic tests were green. So the only way to find out was by customer reports, or worse, by manager reports. There's even worse, right? When the manager stands at your desk and says, the system is not working, you don't know. So yeah, they tried themselves, and they will also get 500 errors. So they got a clue when one of their ops engineers worked from a different country, and he didn't get the issue. So, so they suspected that the problem was in the content delivery network that they were using. And uh, well, they started to investigate, but in order to work around it, they reconfigured the CDN to work around the problem uh, and get a little bit of uh, less of uh, DDoS protection that they would usually have. Um, and, and they would be able to revert it later in case they would get attacked. Uh, and later the, the uh, provider of the CDN uh, implemented a bug fix because it was indeed a uh, problem in, in the content delivery network that was causing uh, this. So, um, Mainly, what they learned from this is mainly as an organization on how to handle uh, incidents. So the, the, they introduced an incident commander who was responsible for driving an incident to resolution uh, because the, the month before they lost focus on it. And now if you have an, an incident commander, then this person is responsible for making sure uh, that you find out all the way to the end what the issue was and, and also how you can uh, quick, quicker resolve future incidents. So in this case also, it's a system that you don't really maintain yourself, that you use as a service, that also can induce uh, interesting problems. And then the final one is my, my favorite. So this is the one where breaking news broke something else. So I remember being, this was also for the educational publisher, uh, we're running an e-learning application, and I remember sitting next to a colleague and I was explaining him like how the dashboards and monitoring worked on our systems. And then he said like, hey, but this doesn't look right. All these notes are going down here. So is this like a, a demo dashboard? And I said, no, this is production. And right away my phone rang and somebody called me like, yeah, we have an issue in production. Okay, interesting. So we started investigating what, what the problem was. And it turned out that all of our, we had like four servers running and it would all go down almost at the same time. So we, we scaled to eight servers and then those eight servers would all go down at the same time. So we started investigating and this was a, like a microservice system that consisted of a few independently deployable uh, services. And it turned out that this was uh, the analytics service that was, was going down. So we said, okay, well, what's the problem? The analytics service is not really a core component of the system. It sends some analytics events that we use to, uh, um, to know how the system is being used. But what's going on? And it turned out that the analytics service would go out of memory with some like max Q size exceeded error or something. And then we knew we we kind of got the idea that was not the problem was not on our side, but on the receiving end. And then it turned out that since we were part of a bigger concern that also was the hosting uh, hosting one of the biggest news sites in the Netherlands, we were using the same analytics service. So we were se se sending the same data to the same service that was used by the biggest news site in the Netherlands. So there were, turned out to be some breaking news at the time. So lots of people visiting this website which overload the analytics service, which made queues overrun on our side, which would make the analytics service on our side go out of memory because it couldn't send requests to the uh, to the other server quick enough. So we, I think we managed by fixing this by uh, scaling up to somewhat like 10 or 20 servers, 
keeping them down all at the same time and then starting them up all at the same time so that they could uh, evenly fill up their queues. And in the end, we managed to have enough servers so we wouldn't have enough queues for the timeouts to run out uh, that we that, that the system wouldn't go out of memory. So what we learned from here was that um, this, this piece of functionality, the analytics service, was not part of the uh, main functionality of the system. Students can perfectly fine use the system when we are not able to send analytics. So in the end, we um, what we learned from this is that we have different ways of, of health checking. So this service would go down, then the final health check for the application would fail and we would take it out of service in the load balancer. So we found out that in this case, the analytics service was not part of the core functionality of the system. So when this thing goes down, it shouldn't fail the entire health check of the application. It should send us a notification like the analytics service is down, but the other parts of the system should be able to run, uh, to run through uh, as usual. So we are at the end. To summarize uh, the approach I discussed to debug distributed systems, it starts with observing and documenting. Make a diagram just like Google. Focus on creating a minimal reproducer so you can have as much tries as possible within the hour. Start debugging anything on the client side, sending the right thing or not. Then start checking DNS and routing. Can we reach, can we get the right IP address? Can we reach the right target machine? Check the connection. So uh, can we open a TCP connection on the right port? Do we get a reject or a drop? Start inspecting traffic. Are we sending the right message? Are we receiving the right message? Are we sending back the right response? Are we receiving the right response? And if all else fails, start debugging on the server side with remote debugging, profiling, or even the S-trace trick I showed you. And obviously, in the end, wrap things up and write a postmortem so uh, that you can share whatever you did and learned and that you can respond quicker or maybe not even have the issue anymore uh, next time this happens. So that's all I wanted to tell you. I hope what I shared helps you debug your next issue. And if not, then I still hope you had fun. I'm ready to take uh, any questions. Do we have questions uh, in the Q&A that I can answer? Yes, there are actually questions. Um, also, like before I start reading the questions from the Q&A section, because there is only one, I have also a question for you. Yeah. Uh, we just saw that you were kind of MacGyver, and um, like jumping through the servers and doing all the things on your own. But how do you learn this? Like, I mean, that's like your steps you had, but then actually um, you have to learn a lot of things actually to get there, to use the techniques and, and, and these kind of things. So yeah. how do you learn this? Um, may, maybe, uh, mainly I'd say by, by either experimenting and finding out things yourself. So in my case, I learned most of these things when I had way too much time in university and started finding out how Linux systems and servers and networking worked. Uh, on the other hand, by uh, talking to, to to colleagues who who have experience in this field and and trying to uh, uh, you know find out what tools are they are using to debugging, because I'm pretty sure that for all the things I shared, there are viable other tools of alternatives that can do the same thing. So uh, hopefully, I, I showed some of the tools that you can use, like Telnet, Netcat, Traceroute, Ping, uh, S Trace, uh, Curl. And, and, and you can put some of these tools in your toolbox and, and remember them just enough next time to look up the MON page and, and find out how you, how you can use them. I think also like the next question leads already into the next step because we have lo looked at the network level, more or less. And um, Gregory is asking actually any tips on, on features in Spring Boot to help with debugging microservices. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it depends on whether you're debugging something on your on your local machine or something that runs remote. So if something that, that runs on your local machine, then typically you can be fairly quick by adding tests or attaching your debugger and actually finding out whatever you want to find out of your application. If it's running somewhere remote, then I typically try to go for, for instrumenting it or adding logging or finding a way to get as much as possible of information about something uh, as close as to, to the problem as possible. So for example, if I have a problem where uh, a request is not processed in the right way, then I might add logging to, uh, to the service that will uh, in the most amount of detail possible show the request that's being sending out, the response that's being uh, received, uh, what's being, how the response is being handled, and then deploy this new version of this service to the server, make a couple of requests, and then find out what's going on with the logging uh, there. 
And you might also attach a remote debugger if you're able to 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 get it to the server where you need to be. So uh, I'd say that 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 my my key um, my key approach here is to try to get as much information as possible in as much as different ways as possible. And and if it's running on a remote server somewhere, then it might be that that adding logging or adding metrics is one of your only options. And then that's what you need to need to deal with. But then I would try to focus on getting as much as information out of there as quickly as possible. And also have quick feedback loops where you want to add some model logging that you can quickly deploy a new version of this uh, this service. Because there's, there's, there's no thing that's as first tasting as when you know exactly what to do, but you cannot do it because you need to wait for something, right? Yeah, so I think also like debugging in production sounds really fun because I always say that you, you actually stop the world for your users. And yep. as you mentioned, metrics, logging and so on is, is better. Or you have a separate deployment actually where you can debug, but then you should be the only user. Otherwise, they are all hitting your, your breakpoint. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, the point is typically that some some problems only occur when there are, you know, there are some load from the user in there. So you, you can only de debug them in production. Yeah. So Alexander is asking, can you really run S trace in the cloud? Uh, well, if, if uh, you need root access to run S trace on a server, because well, it's kind of a security risk, it needs to be installed on the machine. So as long as you have root access and you have uh, uh, and, and you and, and you can uh, run get get the binary on the server, then yes, you can run it. Yeah. But I think also it will be quite uh, difficult to get somebody from Amazon or from Google or from Microsoft on the phone actually running S trace for you in the cloud. Yeah, right? it's obviously so that will be hard. But if it's like a VM or a Docker host that you control, yeah. then obviously you can do this. Yeah. So I don't <laughs> think that they will allow you to run arbitrary S trace commands on their Kubernetes host. But if you control the VMs yourself or even Docker containers, uh, you can still get S trace into a Docker container that you run somewhere. But I and think you need to like... be as close as possible to to uh, the, the actual code that's being executed. So in my case, the Nginx uh, daemon. I think it's anyway very interesting because even like in a big enterprise, you're probably not allowed to access the host. So yep. you need yep. somebody on the other side who can help you actually like achieving this. Yep. But that that's also like from, from my experience a bit that you cannot do all the things on your own, I think. Uh, you need, you're a team in the end fixing these bugs. Yeah, right. and then it helps knowing which tools the others yeah. can use. So chances are that, that most people that are in your operations department have never used S-Trace, right? Because it's a debugging tool. But it can help you gain insights on where, when, why a system is locking up or not receiving the right, re right request or not sending the right response. Yes. Um, Gregor is also writing into the chat that log all useful tracing information, for example, with MDC is if the logger supports that can be also yep. very helpful, right? Yeah, and there are also some, uh, I think they're called trace trace back loggers, where you can uh, make an application uh, uh, like log everything that happened in the past 10 seconds on trace level once an exception occurs. So then it's continuously logging on trace level, but only in memory. Once an exception uh, occurs, it will then spit out the trace information that it gathered in the past couple of seconds or so. Okay, cool. Um, Alexandre asks um, if you already mentioned TCP dump. Ah, yes. So we used TCP dump to um, inspect the HTTP traffic uh, that was happening on port uh, 80. So yes, it definitely can help in inspecting traffic uh, server side. Uh, obviously, it does need to be uh, on a machine that you can access. And also, it, does not, it can be encrypted because then it's a lot harder to, to use it. And he also has another point where he's saying remote debugging and firewalls. Not yes, so a nice trick you can use there is uh, SSH uh, tunneling. So let's say that I need to access uh, port uh, 80 on, on the Open Value web server, right? But uh, I cannot access it uh, right now. So then I can, for example, say SSH um, to uh, at Open Value at now. And now I'm opening my local port uh, 8080. Let me check that I have nothing on 8080. No. Uh, oh, I don't even have talent here. I need to hop to another machine. Local host, uh, let's say uh, 8088. No, I have nothing there. So now for SSH to the web server, say bind local port 88 to 
local host. So I'm logging into the web server and then saying bind to localhost port 80. So once I've done this, then on my local machine, port uh, 8088 will be bound to the open value web server port 80. So now I can say, if I go to my uh, local machine, uh, telnet localhost. No, it was not on my local machine. It was here. Say telnet localhost 8088. So I get HP 101 host open value up now. And I get a response from the server. So what I've now basically done is, is used an SSH connection to uh, log in to this server and then bind this local port to local port 80 on the remote server. Uh, and this, this can help uh, for you to access, for example, debugging ports or whatever. So you can, you can as long as you have an SSH connection, then it's fairly doable to open a port on your local machine that forwards to some port on the remote machine. Great. Thanks a lot. I just um, was writing into the chat. They have the last chance um, to ask questions before I tell something about the next um, events we are going to hold. Yeah, very nice. So all the trickery um, on the command line with the network and so on. And yeah, I guess it needs also a bit experience, right? Yeah, obviously, and and it, 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 it's it's not easy. But the more you know about this entire picture of of all the components that are between you and whatever you're trying to reach, the easier it becomes to reason about this and to try different uh, different things. Okay, great. So then um, let me wrap up the whole session. Um, you are getting an email from us, like for feedback for Bert Jan. We are collecting those, and he will get that afterwards. As usual, we do a draw at the end of the month with an IntelliJ um, license. Then actually also I have to mention the next events we are going to have. And these are not online sessions. These are really on-site events in Lucerne, Basel, and Zurich, where Ed Burns tours, uh, tours Switzerland. So Ed Burns will come uh, in the week of the, uh, I think the 13th of September, and um, is doing talks in three locations in Switzerland. He will be also here for the um, CH Open Workshop Tage, um, having a keynote there as well. And then he stays like for another week and will do some, some um, events with us. And of course, we play with the rules. So um, you don't have to be afraid of this, just to know that. And also um, regarding um, another nice event, which will be also held on site. That's like the art of software review with um, Gernot Starke. And this event will be also um, in Zurich and obviously on site. And then also again, another online talk then about like mistakes and trade-offs when optimizing the hot path. So it's also about architecture and applications. And um, Thomas will be here talking online with me. Great. So that was just like an outlook for the next sessions. And as you know, um, our talks are on YouTube. You probably get a ping if you are subscribed and have the bell pressed on Sunday, 10 o'clock, usually for our talks. And as well, um, Slack. By the way, Bert Jan is also in the Slack channel. So if you have questions, you can ping him as well. And then also the last thing I have to say, it's thank you to the sponsors, to um, you, Bert Jan, and also the people behind the scenes, as always. Well done, thanks a lot. And Thank now you. let's head over to Wonder and let's meet there so we can have a casual chat and maybe you can ask other questions. Maybe Bertian can tell us other war stories. And um, yeah, thank you very much for being here. And of course, you will get our present as usual, but by mail this time. But hopefully, and I'm sure you will be again in Switzerland and we can do like a talk on site. And um, yeah, but you'll get that one per May. Thanks. Thanks. Looking Thanks forward to uh, being on site anywhere in the future. In the future.